Um, good afternoon to um, colleagues and um, um, I, I just went through the list and I see um, uh, Dr. Davis is very difficult to um, say Dr. Davis uh, when we are used to say Minister Davis. So, but uh, um, you are welcome. Um, and um, I also took an advantage uh, of um, an, an invitation to myself, an extended invitation to some of uh, um, the UNECA, UNECA colleagues who are responsible for um, the management of work of UNECA in the Southern um, office. Uh, Dr. Moponga is, uh, is here as well. Um, you are welcome. Um, I think without having to waste too much time, um, so um, we may just have to um, go straight to the presentation, but I, but I think this is um, an important um, session uh, considering what we currently going through um, as, as, um, as a globe. Um, obviously, the specific issues that we would want to engage on um, at CEDEC level as we continue to quantify um, the impact of COVID-19 on our economies. So um, I, I guess this is an important ongoing uh, conversation that uh, should therefore be able to inform um, our um, Build Back uh, Better um, uh, program. Um, so without much as you um, uh, solve, can we, uh, I guess, Neva is ready to um, make uh, inputs. I think we have four presentations, so I guess it's uh, 15 minutes each. Um, and then uh, questions and discussions afterwards. Thank, thank you very much. Neva, over to you. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I was, I'm doing the overview paper, which is supposed to be published at some point by you and you wider. So I don't know if we can share it before then. Um, but maybe I'm sure we can share it. the draft if anyone wants it. I'm sure it's perfectly okay. good to do so. Okay, cool. Because it's, um, it's kind of long. Is anybody else getting odd noises in their headphones? Or is that just me? Anyways, okay, so um, the thing about the pandemic in Southern Africa is that outside of Southern Africa, um, the infections were relatively limited and they mostly started later than in, in the global north. So the, the surges tended to be in the middle of last year rather than in March. Um, part of the reason for that, and I think this is important to think about now, is that there was significantly, significantly less mobility in much of the region, and it's often more rural, which means it's less dense, so people are less likely to catch it, but also there's significant under-testing and under-counting. So in much of the region, you know, you're getting relatively low levels of testing, um, and even um, death rates are hard to count. Um, and what you can see from the picture, though, is that South Africa and then other SACO countries saw the highest reported diagnoses, and it was much lower in the rest of the region. But even then, it, the, the peaks were still lower, and the total incidence, which is what this graph shows through, through March, the total incidence was much lower than in much of the rest of the world, and particularly lower than in the global north. Um, if we look at the economic impact, though, the economic impact was significant and actually rather harsher than in much of the rest of the world on average, although a lot of that is because China pulled up the rest of the world. So the bars are what the IMF is forecasting, and the um, these sort of like dots and triangles are what people are saying in their budgets. So what you can see is that, the again, the the Harshest impacts were still in Saku plus in, plus in Zimbabwe. But the recovery was often stronger if you look at the budget impacts than what the IMF forecast. Even so, we're, we're really only expecting the region to recover around 2022. Um, so this year, even people, the, the GDP will still be smaller this year likely than it was in 2019 through most of the region. Um, it may be better than anticipated if commodity prices stay high. Um, but it, and, and the data are in the paper, but to the extent we can see the figures, 
The decline was almost entirely happened in, 20, in the second quarter of 2020 when there were lockdowns um, in the region, but also internationally. There's been a relatively rapid rebound thereafter, and often it was stronger than what the IMF forecast. If we look at the impact by sector, the biggest impacts were outside, well, the, the least impacts tended to be in mining and agriculture, um, mostly because they were able to work during the lockdowns and also because um, they're less affected by domestic and regional demand. They're basically to a large extent for export. In the case of mining and in the case of agriculture, of course, they're producing necessities. Manufacturing also recovered relatively rapidly, but in most of Southern Africa, of course, it's a, it's a relatively small industry. So in South Africa, manufacturing and mining are both at levels at the levels they were before the pandemic now. But what's been really hard hit has been anything to do with hospitality, that is especially bars and restaurants, but also most cultural services um, and related activities, because demand has come down. And it's not just because of restrictions. We tend to blame restrictions, but of course, it's also because they're just inherently risky to have that kind of social gathering as long as the pandemic isn't under control. So it's easy to blame the restrictions, but the fact is all the evidence is people don't use those services when they're in the middle of a pandemic. And the other thing that's been hard hit has been public transport and especially international air travel. What that essentially means is that international tourism is shut down for the duration of the pandemic. And I think, again, it's easy to blame uh, public health restrictions, but actually all the experience internationally is those things cannot reopen as long as the pandemic is out of control. And the point about international tourism is when you look at the data, it's actually relatively small, but you know it's very lucrative for the people who are involved and it's quite an important source of foreign exchange earnings for the region. So for South Africa, Namibia and Botswana, it's 8% or more of export earnings compared to the global average of 7%. For the rest of the region, it's reported at around half as high, according to the world development indicators. Now, obviously, these data are often badly, um, badly tracked. And then there's just some examples. It's down 70% in, in Namibia, um, in both South Africa and Zimbabwe. You know, you had basically occupancy down by around two thirds, by around three quarters, even in late 2020. A uh, very harsh declines in restaurant sales and employment in bars and restaurants was down particularly hard and the similar figures for Botswana. So what you have is recovery across most of the economy, but bars, restaurants really heavily hit, even though it's not a large sector, but it's enough to drag the economy as a whole. And I think one important thing also is that the impacts have actually aggravated inequality in the region you know, Southern Africa has long been one of the most unequal regions in the world, both in, but I, I don't know where you lost me, but the thing is this, that the pandemic, firstly, the biggest job losses tended to be informal workers and lower level formal workers. Like I said, especially in um, hotels and restaurants and other hospitality activities, which are very labor intensive. So they're disproportionately large as employers. And of course, you also had a lot of losses among small businesses, especially small formal business. In South Africa, it seems like about 10% of small formal businesses have closed down. And also lower, you know, working people in the poor were most affected by budget cuts in 2021, which I'll talk about in more detail in a bit. In contrast, the high income group has been relatively protected from the impacts of the pandemic, both the health impacts and the economic impacts. Um, they're more able to stay safe, um, including being able to work from home. So in South Africa, there are studies that show that the highest rates of infection based on antibody tests were in low income communities, whereas high income communities still have very low rates. Um, but also the global and national asset bubbles that have resulted from low interest rates have really benefited people with wealth. Wealth is even more unequally distributed than, than income. So in terms of where, where you can see it is in terms of the high value of the stock markets internationally also here, but also the, high, the increased value of housing as interest rates have, 
gone down. But also, if you look at job losses, it's been very skewed toward lower level workers, like I said. So in South Africa, 1% of formal managers and professionals have lost their jobs, but around 10% of other formal workers and 15% of informal workers. So it's, it's really the impacts have been very disproportionately skewed toward um, low income and working people, while higher income people have been more able to protect themselves. And I think we need to talk about how that affects policymaking, that if the, in a highly unequal society, um, if the policies to deal with the economic reconstruction and the pandemic itself are being made by people who are effectively less affected by it, that can lead to, a, to um, complications around how policy is made. If we look at some of the global impacts on the region, because they do tend to shape the impact, the economic impacts in particular, um, what we can see is that there's been an increase in commodity prices, particularly metals prices, but that they're very volatile. And I think probably also affected by the asset bubble, because that's what we saw in 2008, that when you have low interest rates, it also tends to drive up the prices of um, metals exports. So this is particularly important in Southern Africa because we are so dependent on metals and energy exports and extractive exports generally. So what you can see this blue here, the light blue is fuels and the dark blue is metals. And you can see it's a much higher share than other developing countries, even if we exclude China and it's a lower share than the world, and it's a higher share than the world as a whole. Whereas other exports are particularly manufacturing exports are very small. And you know, from that standpoint, we've been lucky because the main commodity exports for the region, except for diamonds, they all crashed in the second quarter of the year, but then they rebounded quite strongly with the exception of gold because it's a safe haven. So there's been a very strong recovery since the second quarter of, through the first quarter of 2021, there's been a strong recovery in the prices of all of our exports, except for diamonds. Um, Having said that, I think it's worth noting that with the exception of gold and platinum and diamonds, despite the more recent decline, the prices are still significantly below where they were at the end of the global commodity boom in 2011. So one of the reasons the pandemic hit here so hard is much of the region was already in a recession because of that fall in, in um, major export prices after 2011 and particularly after from 2015. Um, the other things that have helped the, the rebound with, uh, well, what's driven the increase in commodity prices besides the asset bubble was the rebound in China. And also hopefully we will benefit from the stimulus packages in the global North, which have increased global demand. Um, having said that again, I think we should not be counting on overseas tourism for the foreseeable future. I think that you know we're kidding ourselves if we think tourism internationally will just bounce back, um, at least until the region has a stronger vaccine program. So the policy responses in the paper sort of goes through several case studies in terms of each of these dimensions. Basically, we're seeing four areas of policy responses that are relevant. There's public health responses that do have an economic outcome. Um, initially, there were very strict, strict lockdowns in April 2020 that tended to close down much of the economy outside of food and um, some key services. Although there was significant variation across the region, for instance, Zambia didn't do a very heavy lockdown initially, um, and then it got stricter later. Since then, most of the economies opened up. I think basically the world and Southern Africa figured out that if we restrict hospitality services and social gatherings, the rest of the economy is not particularly high risk. So even when we've had restrictions in the second wave and likely now coming on in this third wave, mostly it affects bars and restaurants and alcohol sales in South Africa, but it doesn't really shut down the rest of the economy the way we did in April. However, the, it should be noted that the limited vaccination rollout will have a long-term impact on um, the economy and particularly on, firstly, because it leads to, you know, as long as the, the pandemic is around to get higher um, higher rates of disruption in workplaces because people more people have to go into isolation or quarantine. 
you have people unwilling to go to some kinds of businesses and unwilling to linger in them, um, like basically most entertainment venues, and you have limited tourism. So that, in that sense, the lack of a public health policy that can drive vaccinations and the difficulty of just getting a hold of vaccinations um, is likely to slow down the recovery here. But I do think it's important to say again, as long as the pandemic there, it's not just about restrictions. Even when we don't have restrictions, some businesses simply cannot open profitably on their old model. They have to develop new business models that are less risky in the pandemic, as long as we don't have the vaccinations. The second policy area is around the fiscus and the efforts to have a fiscal stimulus. And there's a really clear pattern across the region, which is, an initial increase in spending in 2020 with a shift to healthcare, obviously, um, but at the same time, a decline in revenues because of the decline in the GDP. And the result was a substantial rise in the budget deficit in most countries. But in 2021, most countries seem to have tried to reverse that and they've started to cut spending, even though the pandemic has continued um, and the GDP is still going slowly, ultimately, in effect, we've seen quite a post-cyclical fiscal policy across the region as a result. Third area is relief programs, that is efforts to support working people in the poor who've lost their livelihoods and to support businesses, small businesses in particular. Um, yeah, it's interesting to me, there was a substantial reliance on cash programs across the region um, so quite a lot of, of um, countries introduced new social grants as relief of distress, as they called it in South Africa. We have this special COVID-19 grant that um, provided just 350 rand a month, but was the very first time in South, that South Africa has ever provided relief to people that was not those to people who were physically able to work. In other words, we have an extensive social grant system, but it's only to people who are too old or too young or disabled. So they're unable to work. Um, having said that, often you had the you know numbers announced, but the numbers who were actually got the relief was often smaller than the initial plans. And all of these relief programs were long were cut long before the economy recovered. Most of them only lasted a maximum of three months. In South Africa, we ended in March, so we it took we kept these programs going for almost a year. But they were cut off in March. And so that means we, we got unemployment insurance to about 3 million people. Well, it was a special unemployment program to 3 million people. And the special COVID-19 special grant, we got to 6 million people. But it ended, in, it ended this past March, even though the economy and employment have by no means recovered. In fact, employment, as is usual, is lagging quite significantly behind the economic recovery. So in effect, you had relief programs, but they were cut quite soon, certainly long before the need ended. And then finally, most countries have announced some form of reconstruction program and recovery program for the economy. But when you looked at them, they mostly just reframed existing policies and projects. So we haven't seen a whole lot of you know, serious innovation in these policies. Um, and since they weren't working that well before, you have to wonder how well they're going to work now. Obviously, it's hard to fund these projects, because, these policies, because people are cutting their budgets. But in some cases, again, we've seen underspending on initial commitments, particularly around credit guarantee programs, which I would argue is because the credit guarantee programs, and this is true internationally, not just in Southern Africa, they were really responding to the 2008-2009 financial crisis when there was, when credit actually just dried up internationally. Um, what happened in the pandemic was that small business was facing a huge amount of risk. Their demand crashed. They weren't allowed often to operate. They didn't want to take on more debt. So the, the credit guarantee programs, people put in the guarantees, but then the borrowing didn't take off. Um, the other thing that was really common across these programs is that everybody is saying what we're going to do, we will invest in infrastructure and we will localize, especially government procurement. And, you know, it's not clear how much people really have thought through what kinds of infrastructure do we need and 
can we actually get infrastructure going in time to actually boost the economy in the short run, particularly when we can't just throw money at it because we're cutting budgets? Because doing public-private partnerships, which is the alternative, does tend to be, you know, does tend to take time. And there are many kinds of infrastructure, particularly infrastructure to improve conditions in poor communities where the private sector can't make a profit and isn't very interested. The other thing about just to flag on local procurement, you know, there hasn't been a lot of regional coordination or support for recovery and reconstruction programs. And every country seems to be now saying they're going to do local procurement. We've already seen even before the pandemic that that can lead to a sort of beggar my neighbor approach where instead of saying who can produce for the region, each country says, I'm only going to buy from my from businesses in my country um, and not from even other regional suppliers. And the result is that nobody actually gets up to economies of scale. So I think that the problem with the local procurement program in a region like ours, where you have relatively small markets at the national level, is you can end up unable to achieve economies of scale in any country. So a bit more coordination there might help. And just to illustrate the fiscal outcomes and why they look so bad, you can see here as a percentage of GDP. Neva, Neva just a minute if you can, please. Um, I think we okay. have now 25 minutes, yeah. Yeah, okay. So just to show that the deficits have gone up and then apologies. Um, yeah, so just to say some of the policy implications, firstly, it really shows that it's easy to talk about moving away from mining dependency, but then the commodity prices go up and it's very hard to move away from them. And in practice, most of the recovery plans are centered on getting mining to work still, just because it's hard to take this in a pandemic. That there's limited scope for traditional stimulus because you know, most of the countries in Southern Africa being small, they don't have leverage with international lenders, but also there's limited supply side capacity. So if you increase government spending, you may end up just importing. That suggests we need more innovative ways to promote a stimulus using, for instance, off budget funds, solidarity taxes, but also more rigorous reprioritization of the budget. Um, the industrialization stuff, what's interesting has been how weak those programs are. And then finally, just the way in which the inequalities lead to very indecisive policy making and the lack of innovation, because the elites are protected from the outcome of the crisis, so they don't take the so they don't see the need to really change doing what we've always been doing. Thank you very much, Rana Boha. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Neva. Um, we, we appreciate that. I I had given you a few more minutes because I, I believe. Um, as part of setting the scene, we also want to make sure that uh, the upcoming presentations, whether can we be able to locate um, their experiences um, on the reflections that you have just uh, um, made. Um, so um, can I request Lars to um, load his presentation, uh, um, if he's ready? Um, thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kumalo. And, uh, um, good afternoon to all the uh, presenters and uh, uh, attendants or participants. Uh, let me just upload uh, my presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a, a very brief uh, overview on, on the situation in Namibia. Um, we uh, discovered or, or the first case of, of COVID-19 in the country was uh, confirmed on 13th March uh, 2020. And uh, government responded uh, uh, immediately, uh, declared a state of emergency for six months, and um, also uh, ordered the lockdown of two of our 14 regions, Comas, uh, with the capital Windhoek, and the Rongo region, that is the uh, region at the coast with the port of Wolfis Bay and Swakopmund as uh, one of the major tourism uh, destinations. Um, there was uh, uh, some, yeah, some loosening, let's say, of, of the lockdown afterwards and uh, strengthening uh, again, uh, always depending on, on the uh, increase in, in, in case numbers. And um, borders were also uh, closed, uh, which of course, as uh, Neva already indicated, 
had a serious impact on, on, on our tourism industry. We reopened the borders in uh, September um, and um, schools also uh, reopened. Uh, previously, uh, we had um, uh, online or, or distance learning, uh, which is, of course, uh, extremely challenging uh, in a country where we don't even have sufficient uh, classrooms, uh, let alone all schools are connected to water, electricity, and uh, internet. So it didn't really work. And uh, But uh, universities uh, remain closed until now even, and uh, have um, uh, con um, continued with online lecturing. We still have a curfew uh, between 10 o'clock in the night and, and 4 o'clock in the morning, but otherwise, uh, Businesses um, are open, uh, offices are open, uh, and uh, uh, life is almost uh, back to normal. Uh, as of yesterday, we had about uh, 52,000 cases uh, of COVID-19 uh, in Namibia, unfortunately, uh, 733 deaths, um, and about 400,000 uh, persons were tested. Uh, we have a population of about 2.5 million, just to put it into perspective. So far, uh, about 53,000 persons uh, have been vaccinated, uh, mainly with Sinopharm or AstraZeneca uh, produced in, in India, so the COVID shield. We expect more vaccinations uh, in, in the near future, but it remains, uh, I would say, a bit uncertain and uh, we are certainly quite behind in uh, terms of uh, vaccination uh, of our population. And that has an impact on, on or might have an impact on, on tourism because we are still on the red list in, in Europe, meaning uh, tourists um, traveling to Namibia, which is uh, pro possible uh, without quarantine here. They just need to have a, a negative uh, COVID-19 test. Uh, but on return, they, as far as I know, um, have to quarantine for up to 10 days. And uh, that might uh, um, maybe uh, limit the number of uh, uh, tourists uh, coming to Namibia. Let me briefly go through the uh, uh, government response after the uh, 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 cases, uh, the first cases were uh, confirmed in Namibia. Um, and we also, uh, during May, uh, we uh, uh, had a new government, uh, the term ended, um, the five-year term, uh, five term ended in, on the 20th of, of March. And we had a new uh, uh, Minister of Finance uh, who was thrown, uh, I would say, in, in the deep end and had to come up not only with a um, realistic budget, uh, but also with a uh, stimulus and, and uh, support package uh, that was announced uh, on the 1st of April. And it amounted to, to 8.1 billion uh, Namibia dollar, uh, of which uh, almost 6 billion were direct support and uh, 2.3 billion of balance sheet uh, liabilities. In addition, uh, Bank of Namibia, like the South African Reserve Bank, uh, cut the repo rate by about uh, 200 or by 200 basic points and uh, also initiated further uh, easing of, of banking regulations. So part of this uh, support for businesses uh, included bid subsidies, uh, um, accelerated VAT refund, uh, which is uh, in particular for small and medium size or micro small and medium size enterprises uh, uh, extremely uh, important and uh, the accelerated uh, uh, payment of, of approved and, and uh, verified invoices. These uh, two um, packages uh, amounted uh, to almost half of, of the whole uh, support package, namely 3.8 uh, billion um, Namibia dollar. And then there were some other sectoral uh, support programs and uh, kind of tax back loan schemes for, for certain companies and, and policy uh, reliefs. Um, also on, on the labor side, um, uh, it, um, or temporary wage cuts of uh, between uh, 
20% and then 40% uh, for the hardest uh, sectors like tourism, uh, transport uh, were allowed. We, uh, or the government also introduced a so-called emergency income grant of uh, 750 Namibia dollar once off uh, for formal and informal sector employees um, that uh, benefited uh, about 750,000 um, Namibians. And um, there were also uh, tax back uh, loan schemes for employees and, and self-employed uh, persons to the value of 1.1 uh, billion. And the water subsidy uh, of, of uh, 10 million to the water corporation. So that uh, um, in particular um, residents uh, of uh, informal settlement had uh, unlimited access uh, to water in order to, to wash hands and, and so on. The Ministry of Health uh, got an additional 1.1 billion uh, to, for the purchase of uh, personal protective equipment and other uh, COVID-19 uh, related equipment and, uh, and um, uh, testing uh, and respirators. A little bit later, uh, the Ministry of Finance uh, in uh, cooperation with the Social Security Commission announced further uh, support measures uh, to the tune of uh, more than 600 uh, million uh, Namibia dollar for certain uh, industries, uh, in particular transport, uh, construction, uh, and, and tourism, uh, in, in order to retain uh, employment and uh, also um, support uh, individuals uh, who uh, suffered loss of income. Um, and and uh, some of these uh, um, initiatives uh, were in part uh, cash subsidies uh, um, for, of 17% uh, of the total wage pool um, with the condition that no retrenchments uh, um, were done and uh, that uh, no salaries were cut uh, uh, to more than 50%. Interestingly, uh, the labor law allowed uh, only 40%, so I don't know how that was uh, harmonized. Some, some of the other uh, benefits uh, for, for employees uh, um, um, included uh, a 50% benefit of the monthly salary uh, with at least uh, uh, 1,000 uh, Namibia dollar. Um, but if you are uh, uh, benefited from the emergency income grant, uh, this was uh, reduct, uh, uh, yeah, uh, deducted. Uh, in addition to, to, to government uh, initiatives, also the private sector uh, stepped in and uh, provided uh, donations of various kinds uh, uh, for the health sector um, donations, but also for in particular informal settlements, uh, water tanks uh, to improve sanitation, food parcels and so on and so forth uh, were uh, in, um, distributed. And uh, two uh, um, NGOs um, installed tens of thousands of very basic uh, tippy tanks uh, that uh, allowed uh, residents to wash their hands regularly. Uh, without uh, uh, touching any tabs. And so um, on, on the one hand, uh, government uh, responded, uh, uh, I would say, uh, quickly to, to the challenges uh, posed uh, by the cases. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think it's a bit uh, euphemistic uh, to, to talk about a stimulus uh, package of uh, uh, more than 8 uh, billion. Uh, because, uh, as I indicated, um, VAT refunds uh, in our uh, payments of overdue invoices and so cannot really be uh, classified as a stimulus, uh, but uh, should be part of, of normal uh, uh, government uh, business um, anyhow. It's also not clear uh, 
the uptake uh, of of uh, these various other offers um, of loans and 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 tax uh, refunds and so by business and and individuals and no data has been released yet uh, so therefore it's un unclear uh, what the um, exact um, uh, impact on on the economy um, has been what has also not been introduced uh, and, and, and should have been considered is, of course, uh, uh, contribution holidays uh, for, uh, for medical aid uh, schemes, pension funds, and so on and so forth, or even uh, income tax uh, payments, and so to ease the immediate uh, uh, impact on, on, on the uh, cash flow. Coming to the economic impact uh, based on the preliminary national accounts uh, for 2020, the economy uh, contracted by about 8%, which is uh, the steepest uh, decline since independence in, in 1990. So we had a, uh, not a handful of, of years with a, um, with a contraction in the economy, uh, but never to this uh, extent. And uh, due to the uh, um, population growth, per capita income declined by almost uh, 10%. As already uh, indicated by Neva, uh, the uh, hotels and restaurants, so the, the, the tourism sector was um, the most severe uh, affected. Although I would say the contraction indicated in the national account of 33% is, is rather mild uh, because our main uh, holiday um, season or tourism season uh, is between July and then and, and, uh, October during the Northern Hemisphere uh, summer. And um, tourists only trickled uh, into the country um, after the borders were reopened. Um, our main airport in Windhoek is the Hosea Kotaku International Airport and arrivals or international arrivals there dropped by 79% uh, from more than 210,000 uh, in 2019 to just uh, 46,000 um, in, in 2020. So therefore, um, I'm uh, a bit surprised by, by just the- Just two minutes close, unfortunately. Okay. And then, of course, it's not just hotels and restaurants, but other tourism related uh, industries such as tour guides, operators, car rental companies that all uh, fall under business services, uh, service stations, and uh, also very important uh, community conservancy that uh, often have uh, uh, agreements with uh, tour operators and, and uh, uh, hunters um, and, and derive the income. Uh, were severely affected. Transport uh, declined by more than 20%. Air transport even by 95% uh, during the second quarter. Uh, air transport services, so airports company by 76%. Manufacturing uh, beverages uh, minus 36% um, during, uh, during 2020. Manufacturing overall by 20% meat processing is a different case. It has nothing to do with COVID, um, but with the pre, uh, uh, droughts in the previous years and farmers uh, restocking. Um, two uh, sectors, probably as elsewhere in the world, uh, benefited, namely information and communication that uh, increased by more than 17%, and even the health sector by al almost uh, 5%. But uh, we expect, or I expect, uh, uh, as elsewhere in the world, a K-shape uh, recovery, meaning uh, the gap between the better off and, and uh, the not so well off uh, will uh, increase and uh, will worsen the already or con continuously high income inequality in Namibia with a Gini coefficient of uh, 0.56. Um, the budget deficit uh, is uh, about uh, was about 10% uh, for 2020-2021, uh, uh, and uh, it's uh, projected at uh, slightly below 9% uh, for the current year, which will push up uh, the debt to GDP, GDP ratio well over uh, 70 or even close to to 80% uh, in, in the next uh, 
few years. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have uh, concrete data from, from the labor market. The latest uh, survey dates back to 2018. Official uh, data suggest uh, job losses uh, to the magnitude of 12,200 for 2020, which, uh, in my opinion, is certainly severely underestimated uh, because of job losses, in particular in the informal sector and, and um, yeah, in, in some other. Uh, sectors. Uh, we conducted a survey in, in October last year um, where respondents indicated, uh, or 36 percent of respondents indicated that uh, they reduced employment by between 50 and 100 percent and an additional uh, 6 percent almost by up to 49 percent. So more than 40 percent uh, had to retrench workers. But uh, 56% also indicated uh, that um, they haven't changed employment, but uh, a lot of these employers um, had to cut uh, wages and salaries in, in order to, to um, uh, balance the, um, yeah, the cash flow. Uh, very briefly, last slide. Um, I think what, what uh, needs to be done, and uh, it, it, unfortunately it hasn't uh, been and in the last uh, budget that was tabled in, in March this year, namely that we need to reprioritize expenditure to social infrastructure. I think that's a lesson we have learned from, uh, from the COVID-19 outbreak. We need to address um, the lack in education facilities. We need to have proper classrooms. We can't talk about uh, online learning. And so if uh, we don't even have proper classrooms, but uh, provisional structures, uh, schools uh, are not connected to water and sanitation, neither to electricity, let alone internet. The same applies to health facilities um, in order to, to um, move towards um, um, internet uh, uh, connections and, and uh, uh, e-medicine uh, e and, and e-health and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we also need to um, uh, invest in the informal settlements and so and uh, provide bike infrastructure in order to uh, improve sanitation and, and uh, uh, curb uh, outbreaks of uh, pandemics. Um, we have discussed in Namibia since uh, decades uh, the introduction of a national health insurance or national pension fund in order to uh, provide a stronger safety net uh, for the most vulnerable. There hasn't been uh, much uh, progress uh, with it uh, yet. And I think it, that needs to be put on the agenda uh, again. And we need to regain uh, fiscal space. There are a few options uh, definitely in the budget. Uh, the public service medical aid scheme, for instance, receives a, a subsidy of uh, more than 2.6 uh, Billion, which amounts to almost uh, 20,000 per public sector employee. Uh, it cannot be expected from uh, other taxpayers also to cover the um, medical aid schemes of, uh, uh, of the public sector. Um, and we need to reform our uh, public enterprises. Uh, Erna Media is now being uh, liquidated, but there are other loss making. Um, uh, public enterprises uh, with uh, no real uh, justification. And uh, we need to address these to gain fiscal space and, and redirect uh, our expenditure to priority areas. Thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you, um, um, Klaus, for um, that uh, presentation. Um, colleagues, I will plead with the, the next presenters to um, like to keep it short. I think in the meantime, maybe uh, the presentations that uh, have already been made can be shared with the colleagues so that um, um, they can um, utilize some of the information that might not have necessarily been presented to prepare for um, to prepare for the discussion that's coming later. Um, my brother Gibson, are you are you ready? Okay, thank thank you very much uh, and. Uh... Good afternoon, colleagues. I'll just briefly uh, outline what the paper sought uh, to do. And this paper was done in December of last year. Uh, 
basically to provide an overview of the emerging challenges and the extent of the pandemic. And as the other colleagues have already touched on, uh, look at some of the policy responses adopted by government to slow the pandemic and as well as uh, induce uh, economic recovery. Then also look at some of the pathways through which uh, COVID-19 induced challenges undermine the economic performance. Then uh, policies implemented by government to promote economic recovery. And I'll conclude with a few re reflections on what could be done to stimulate uh, the economy. And uh, also this was in anticipation of the uh, second wave of the pandemic, which was beginning to bite in as of uh, January uh, this year. The uh, total numbers are as, uh, uh, shown on the uh, screen, where as of July uh, 2020, we at that time did have uh, about one or 1,306 active cases and 26 deaths. 488 uh, recovered, but that situation uh, changed with regards to January, where we then also saw uh, confirmed cases increasing to 32,304, and uh, the deaths had also increased. And as I said, when we the paper was just being concluded January, we are beginning to get into the uh, second wave, and uh, it was a bit vicious. And there were concerns even at that time that there is quite a, a, a impact on the human capital and the economy. And what's in yellow there is just uh, the latest figures that you find on the uh, Minister of Health uh, and Child Care in terms of March uh, 2021, uh, showing that the cases have actually increased to 36,882. Uh, uh, with uh, 1,529 uh, deaths. And as of today, uh, in the paper is uh, on the COVID update, is showing that we are 38,349 with uh, 36,349 recoveries and 1,582 uh, deaths. So that's uh, the situation in terms of uh, the, 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 the COVID-19. And in terms of uh, the paper just talks up briefly about some of the disruptions that COVID-19 uh, did uh, have on the economy. These relate to obviously the disruptions with regards to re regional and local value chain supply chains. Most of our industries, they depend on inputs, uh, imported intermediate inputs. And because of the closure of borders, uh, that were in line with the lockdown restrictions that also affected the supply of inputs. And also there was a drop in demand with regards to their, their products as there was restriction of movements and disruption on the procurement of, of raw materials and merchandise uh, resale. What you also saw is the COVID-19 in a way was provided a, a very strong stress test on the economy in terms of its resilience and the resilience of the productive capacity of the economy. It also reflected uh, capacity of government to respond timelessly to the pandemic. Given that the country was also already grappling with challenges related to uh, the drought and uh, the cyclone Idai, this also put a stress in terms of uh, a response because part of the response was reallocating of resources from other sectors or other budgets to be able to, to cope with that. I'll speak to that later. Then there was also a stress test with regards to financial adequacy of the financial resource base to provide a stimulus package, which was a common response across the world, that you, there, there was a, a stimulus package that would then resuscitate the economy. But given also the fiscal constraints, that the government was facing, this also presented a challenge. Uh, and also related to that is also the issue of safety nets for the vulnerable groups. Yes, uh, as uh, has already been highlighted, that part of the response was uh, relief packages. But again, that related also to the budget available for that. It was also a challenge from that perspective, even though 
there was some uh, progress in that area. Then uh, the COVID-19 also came with uh, at the back of already uh, some structural challenges that uh, the economy was already in with regards to very low uh, agricultural output of the previous year given uh, the drought. And the country was also grappling with, particularly in the eastern part of the country, to restore infrastructure that was destroyed by uh, COVID-19. No, no, by, by Cyclone Idai. But as has already been mentioned, uh, the issues of social infra infrastructure and infrastructure that's necessary to ensure that the country responds better also presented challenges in that regard. Uh, that table there just showing you some of the key findings which uh, the uh, CSO, I mean, Simstad rather, did in 2020 uh, just to see what the issues were. And the key issues that they picked, one was issues of awareness uh, and nearly uh, most of the people interviewed were aware of the, the COVID-19. So the, the, I think the, in terms of uh, informing the, the, the citizens of the challenges related, there was uh, progress there. But you then find also that uh, urban areas were most affected by water shortages. And with, within the COVID-19 water was, it became a, a key issue of, of response. But the water shortages was also in relation to the drought that we are already experiencing in the country. And this was more in urban areas than in rural areas. Then there were capabilities of buying food and medical supplies. This picked up the issues related to restrictions of movement. Then you also look at 40% uh, of the children continue engaging in education. This related to uh, accessibility to e-learning facilities. Uh, then you also look at the wage workers in urban areas were affected more. And I think it picks up to what uh, uh, was already mentioned earlier in terms of uh, the low income earners being affected, those in the informal sector players. Then the coverage of food aid and other government uh, programs was, was also low. And I think this picks up the issue I've already highlighted with regards to budgetary constraints. Then when you look at the severity of the uh, impact uh, by, by, by sector, you also find out that the, uh, the mining sector was uh, the impact was counterbalanced by firming uh, international prices, particularly for the precious metals, and also the initiatives taken by government to support uh, the, the sector. Because I think around April, this sector was then designated as an essential service and production uh, continued. But one sector in the, one subsector, the chrome and ferrochrome was most affected and it registered a decline of about four uh, minus four percent, and uh, the, the Zimbabwe Chamber of Mines also did uh, an, a, a quick assessment to understand what the sector was and also perceptions from the executives what they see the future being, and they did indicate uh, seventy percent of them that uh, their employment levels will be maintained at the twenty twenty uh, levels while about 20% expected that uh, there will be, they, will, they expected an increase in, 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 in uh, employment. This was uh, before the, uh, the impact of the, of the second wave. And similarly, the manufacturing side, uh, the Confederation of Zimbabwe Industry also did a SNAP survey in uh, March, uh, 23 to 30 March. And they also noted and observed one of the, their findings that 80% of companies surveyed were failing to access both uh, their source and export uh, markets in terms of inputs and in terms of um, their exports. This also relates to the issue of uh, uh, the border closures. And uh, I think as Neva did highlight, the tourism sector was badly affected. And I think in the Zimbabwean case, there was a closure of about five months between April and August and uh, some of the tourism facilities were closed to, 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 to avoid the spread of the, uh, of the virus. This did affect the performance of the sector and also its recovery. Uh, so the, the, the lockdown period also, there's a study there by Matsungo and colleagues 
which also re, uh, noted that uh, there was a food prices uh, increases and there was also a decrease in dietary di diversification because of access to, to markets and access to, to food. This also elevated levels of stress, disrupted diets and consumption patterns of, of, of citizens. Now, in terms of policy response, I think, uh, as has already been mentioned, I think Zimbabwe also adopted similar policy responses. Initially, it was the reprioritization of budget allocations and repurposing of staff and facilities to be able to cope with the pandemic. Some uh, facilities which were, say, schools were also designated as uh, quarantine centers and all that. So there was this repurposing of facilities, institutions, and also uh, budgets for purposes of uh, containing the pandemic. But this was also buttressed by policy and legislative uh, measures that were put in place with regards to uh, uh, containing the pandemic. For example, there was the public health COVID preven prevention, containment and treatment national lockdown order of 2020, which made it uh, illegal and mandatory to observe the, co the, 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 the COVID-19 restrictions. This limited, uh, and it focused on limiting human-to-human -human transmission, including health personnel. And uh, you also had L identification isolation of, of patients. And there was also issue of narrowing the, uh, the, the, the knowledge gap uh, with the disease transmission uh, chain. And uh, in terms of minimizing uh, social and economic impact, government also instituted uh, an 18.2 billion stimulus package and des uh, designated certain sectors as essential services. These included agriculture uh, and uh, uh, mining as well, and other essential health providing institutions. And much later, uh, after the lifting of the lockdown restriction, government did put a waiver on value-added tax payable to domestic tourism on accommodation and other tourism-related services. This was in acknowledgement of the key challenge that the tourism sector faced and the need to resuscitate it. And uh, Let, let's, try, let's try two minutes, my brother. <clears throat> it's OK. I'm almost there. Uh, so the other measures that government uh, did put in place basically is also to uh, stabilize the macroeconomic uh, environment and the number of issues areas that the uh, government touched on, uh, including the issue, I mean, the adoption of the uh, Dutch auction system in June of 2020, and that has also helped to stabilize the economy and helped in terms of uh, moving the, the economy forward. In terms of some reflections on uh, going forward, there is the issue of mobilizing resources to capacitate the health system. I think COVID-19 showed that structural weaknesses were, which were already present in the health system needed to be addressed, particularly in areas of augmenting diagnostic and laboratory capacity of national health facilities. It also reflected that we need to capacitate local industries to produce foodstuffs, pharmaceutical uh, products, as well as personal, protective equipment. And this, I think, is where the local university uh, innovation hubs are beginning to look at ways in which they could enhance that production. And also exploring options to procure and roll out uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccines. I think in the country, COVID-19 vaccines were rolled out in February and they were launched in uh, Victoria Falls. And uh, uh, government is moving to try and uh, uh, get the 60% uh, head uh, immunity. Then uh, the, the other area, it also reinforced the issue of looking at the productive sectors and how these productive sectors can actually be further capacitated. Uh, there is also need to uh, push the economy back on track in terms of achieving the 2020, 2030 uh, 2030 uh, vision of an upper middle income economy. But I think what is critical, particularly from the uh, manufacturing sector, is to further do a lot of diagnostic studies that look at the sector specific impacts of uh, COVID-19 on the various sectors, so as to inform the uh, measures that can be adopted 
to try and get the economy back as we try to see and move the economy, build back or forward uh, better. The other areas, just my last slide, is the need to reconfigure strategies and investment priorities, particularly in the area of digital and online technology platforms for business continuity, enhancing service delivery, and mainstreaming work from home as a new normal. I think for companies that had these facilities, they didn't suffer much, but for a lot of other companies that did not have the capacity, uh, this did affect, and as well as even the educational institutions. So I think there's potential changes in the work environment as production processes are automated. So this also has to be taken on board with regards to the thrust to create more jobs. So that change presents policy challenges, which I think need to be discussed and deliberated to further. Lastly, uh, I think the dynamics that we have seen with the COVID-19 in country and within the region and across the world also shows the need for innovative approaches and partnerships and knowledge sharing on how best to cope with COVID-19 because it has shown a very strong staying power. So going forward, I think uh, it still remains a key policy question, what can be done better to build back better or build forward better? I think those are my submissions for now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chigumira. Um, appreciate it. We are um, running out of um, time. We actually supposed to be starting the discussion, but um, let's give an opportunity to Dumeleng um, Gwena to make some reflections on the experiences in Botswana. Um, uh, and, and hopefully we can also do it within 15 minutes and, and, and ask colleagues to give us at least extra 10 minutes after, after the presentation. Um, thank you very much. Over to you, my brother. Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Um, and afternoon to all the presenters as well as the attendees. Thank you. Um, so this afternoon, I'll be sharing Botswana's experience with COVID, looking at their economic impact, um, as, as well as um, their socioeconomic response. So really this was a study based on the, ca on the case study that we did um, as part of the broader paper um, that Niva has presented. So what I'm gonna start with is a quick overview of Botswana, um, which is a sparsely po populated country with about 2.4 million people. And for the past decade has recorded an average GDP of 3.6%. Um, the prudent use of its mineral resources and good governance has transformed Botswana into a middle-income country. Um, so far, the country has also set an aspiration of becoming um, a high-income country by 2036. Um, Botswana is highly dependent on international trade, which accounts for about 77% of its country's GDP in 2018. Um, if you look closely, diamonds account for about 90% of goods export, and tourism um, contributes about 8% of um, total export revenues. And due to its uh, heavy dependence on diamond exports and international tourism, Botswana has become particularly vulnerable to weak global demands as well as um, travel restrictions. As a result, we've seen um, Botswana's economy decline by 6% as a whole in 2020, um, with a sharp contraction of about 24% in the second quarter. Um, looking at the extent of the pandemic in Botswana, um, the incidence of COVID is comparatively high um, in the SADC region, second only to South Africa. And as of 13 May, Botswana had a total case of about 40, 49,000 confirmed cases and 751 COVID-related deaths. Um, if you look at the daily confirmed cases, um, here on the graph as shown as seven-day rolling averages, um, they have been fluctuating but indicating an, upper, an upward trend. Um, they reached a peak in about early March this year uh, before declining um, in early April this year. So Botswana recorded the highest daily case um, in the, on the 1st of March with about 2,356 new cases. And Botswanan authorities have blamed the surge in March this year um, to the new variant that was discovered in South Africa um, in November, 2020. Similarly, um, the initial spread of the virus in Botswana was blamed on truck drivers and other travelers that are coming from South Africa. 
Um, when you look at the public health measures, Botswana acted quite quickly um, to slow down the spread of, of the virus because they recognized that they, have a, they had a very limited um, health sector. So they closed borders and suspended overseas trips um, even before registering the, um, the first case and we subsequently went into full lockdown after only three diagnoses. Um, the government, six weeks later, the government began to reopen the economy, uh, starting with businesses on the first week, and then the second week, they started um, reopening schools. However, much like South Africa's economic main, sect, uh, main economic center, centers, um, Khaburoni became um, um, the, the epicenter of the pandemic. Um, and then it was subsequently put under full lockdown. However, when the government um, lifted the lockdown restriction in Khaburoni, they opted for a very different method whereby they relied on comparatively narrow regulations such as alcohol bans and curfews in order to control um, the spread of the virus. In terms of the vaccination rollout, Botswana started officially on the 26th of uh, March this year. And as of 14 May, they had administered about 53,000 doses of COVID um, vaccine. And if that's enough to have vaccinated about 1.2% of, of the country's population. And this is assuming that um, each person um, needs two doses. Um, if you look at the recent news, Botswana authorities claim that um, they've secured nearly 2 million doses of COVID vaccine from various manufacture, uh, manufacturers. Um, and this is enough to cover um, the adult population. About 1.1 million of those um, vaccines that they've secured comes from Johnson & Johnson, um, which is um, a one-dose vaccine. So we could really be seeing Botswana as the first African country to have vaccinated its entire um, adult population. However, there is no clear date when these vaccines will arrive in the country. In terms of the economic impact, um, Botswana experienced the largest decline in the SADC region with a contraction of about 24% in the second quarter of 2020. And this contraction was largely due to a sharp decline in mining, trade, as well as hospitality. Um, when you look at quarter four of this year of, of 2020, um, real GDP contracted by 4.1%, which is an overall improvement compared to um, the previous quarters of 2020. However, it is still um, a significant decline compared to Q quarter four of 2019. Um, the improvement of GDP in each quarter since um, the beginning of lockdown is a result of the continuous effort on behalf of government to reopen businesses and resume economic activities safely. Um, when you look at um, international trade, imports declined from 17 billion in the second quarter of 2019 to 14 billion in the second quarter of 2020. Um, exports declined steeply from 18 billion in the second quarter of 2019 to 14 billion in the second quarter of 2020. However, in the fourth quarter of 2020, we are seeing um, shown signs of recovery with imports surging to 23 billion um, and ex exports also increasing to 17 billion. Um, looking at sectorial level, the mining sector, particularly diamonds, continue to suffer from weak global demands. Um, as, as Niva has mentioned, um, lockdown restriction affected all sectors except for agriculture. However, the impact um, is different across all sectors. If you look at the second quarter of 2020, uh, mining suffered the sharpest decline, followed by trade and hospitality. In the fourth quarter of 2020, mining contracted by 24% due to um, continuous weak demand. However, this was compounded by lower local demand from coal because one of the power stations in Botswana was going through remedial works. Similarly, water and electricity declined by 20% um, because only one operation, um, only one unit was in operation at Morukule power station. Um, looking at um, Botswana's socioeconomic response to the pandemic, um, government spending fell by 4% in real terms as its revenue plummeted. It, the government also um, slashed its investment by 30% while expanding current, current expenditure by 2%. However, despite um, the efforts to, to curb the spending in 2021 budget, um, the deficit more than, more than doubled in, in constant pooler. Um, it reached 12% of, of total GDP 
compared to 6% earlier on. Um, also, the government in early this, uh, early this year, they began to, to be worried about um, the deficit. So they become very unwilling to impose stringent um, um, restriction because they, they were not prepared to fund um, any more relief measures. So if you look at um, Botswana's physical response, it, it, it really um, shows long standing factors, which is the critical importance of diamond revenues um, for Botswana's budget, um, as well as Botswana's highly conserva um, conservative microeconomic policy. In terms of monetary policy response, the Bank of Botswana um, reduced the interest rates um, from 4.75% to 4.25%. Um, these rates were reduced again in August. Um, and the bank also um, reduced the capital adequacy ratio from 15% to 12.5%. Um, other measures that the Bank of Botswana um, provided include regulatory forbearance on non-performing loans, um, as well as broadening access to repo facilities. Um, in terms of social protection, Botswana provided um, a, co uh, a COVID relief fund with a total of about 3 billion pula. And really this fund provided um, various forms of relief, including wage subsidies designed to limit retrenchment, as well as support um, the public health sector. As of 2020, um, Botswana had disbursed about 1.8 billion of that 3 billion and almost 800 million went for waste support. And when we look at industrial policy, Botswana, like any other country, um, announced economic recovery and transformation plan, um, which was allocated about 15 billion. And this plan is really an extension of the ex existing blueprint economic development plans in Botswana. Um, the government also set up um, about 1.3 billion industrial support fund to support SMEs, tourism, agriculture, as well as informal businesses. Um, the National Development Banks set up um, agricultural stimulus fund or that cost about um, 50 million pula for smart farming. Um, so in terms of the economic recovery, it will be funded entirely from um, domestic and international markets. However, Botswana in the past used to finance um, its development plans from the sovereign fund, but that fund has been depleted due to a large um, budget deficit. Um, the Minister of Finance indicated that the level of fund has declined from 19 billion at the end of 2019-2020 financial year to about um, 6 billion in November 2020, which represents about 72% decline. So as, as a concluding remark, um, the COVID-19 has exposed Botswana's vulnerability um, as the economy is heavily reliant in, on mining, particularly um, on diamonds for its growth. Um, the economic recovery plan um, recognizes the importance of diversification, um, similar to any other plans in Botswana. Um, they do recognize the need to transform and reduce their um, reliance um, on mining, um, but they can be more they can be more to, uh, done in order to boost recovery as well as uh, accelerate growth. Um, the first option that Botswana can look at is import localization. Um, the country imports bulk of its consumer goods from South Africa, which is about 67%. Um, there lies an opportunity for Botswana to look at um, some of the value chain where they have capacity in order to, to, to produce some of the goods domestically. In terms of tourism, um, Botswana could make um, tourism um, attractive to local and regional um, tourists. Currently, Botswana attract mainly um, international tourists due to higher prices. Um, so preferential pricing um, could be used in this instance. However, it is important to note that um, due to um, COVID-19, um, tourism um, is a, a, a quite be a long strategy, but it still needs to be something that they look at um, in order to, um, to diversify their economy. So this is all um, I had to present so far, um, and I hope I look forward to, to the engagement. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, um, um, Milling. Um, um, so I'll, uh, I'm not sure how you would prefer us to handle this discussion considering the time, but as I said, I'm hoping colleagues can be able to give us um, uh, 10 extra minutes um, um, and, and um, maybe I should um, 
check whether the first question that was put uh, by uh, Zengai was actually answered. Or, or my brother, do you want to probably um, just have a first bite whilst um, other colleagues are, are preparing their questions and, and probably maybe straight to uh, discussions than mainly um, um, questions? Um, Sol and Zengai, if, if, if able to make a contribution. Thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks, Temba. Uh, I think uh, Neva has actually responded to, to, to some of the questions. But however, uh, I just made a comment to say, I mean, um, listening from all the discussions, it seems like uh, almost all the countries uh, try to, to, to have some support of some kind, either physical or mental support. So the issue here is, I think, going forward, we really need to start having a conversation now to say uh, the issue of tech, government tech sustainability. Uh, to what extent are we going to be having that conversation and are we going to be so uh, stiff in terms of saying do we have a uh, fiscal rules or not because i believe that it, it's going to be a case by case uh, situation on how on how we are going to deal with a uh, issue of government debt but then uh, maybe let me also uh, make some comments in regards to what uh, Gibson Chigumbula have presented uh, I, I was expecting to to see that uh, given the the structure of the Zimbabwean economy, uh, uh, there was supposed to be more of a conversation on how the informal sector has been impacted by this COVID. Because I think we, we all know that um, the, 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 the structure of the economy now is more of an informal sector than the formal sector. So maybe a, a study, if possible, to understand how the informal sector has been impacted by, uh, by, the, by, by the COVID. I think it will also help policy discussions going forward. And then, uh, uh, also on Zimbabwe, one thing which I thought also I would want to understand, given that uh, the government has got limited fiscal freedom, uh, to what extent have they now tried maybe to engage uh, ex ex external, external stakeholders such as uh, NGOs and other civic organizations to maybe play a part in providing that uh, social protection or social need to those who are in it? Thanks. Um, th thank you very much. Um, any other question before Dr. Chibumira reacts to that? Um, and I think um, a part of what we may have to discuss is the point that Niva made earlier on about uh, some kind of lack of uh, uh, cooperation as, in, as a regional response to the challenges that uh, we faced or we are still facing. Um, as to um, to what extent um, they would have probably prevented um, some of the things that um, individual countries had to battle um, on, on their own, obviously learning um, from each other. Um, any takers? Um, Neva? Yeah, just on the fiscal thing, that I think that when you look at all the countries together, you realize that what we, I mean, it doesn't actually apply to Zimbabwe because they've actually managed to maintain a surplus but they also have very low spending relative to GDP. And I, I mean, I'm assuming this has more to do with lack of access to, to borrowing than, than wanting to have a surplus, but in some ways that's the exception that proves the rule that it's easy to say, you know, this issue of sustainability, I mean, what really came through to me was we have to see that in terms of the position of our countries in the global financial markets. And maybe, Saul, you might also want to speak to this, that, you know, we have a situation where we're not big players on global financial markets. And, you know, even Botswana got a downgrade. Um, credit ratings downgrade, so did South Africa, so did some other countries. All of that makes it much more expensive to borrow. And then, of course, governments it's, it will tend to pull back. All I'm saying is what that says to me is we need to find innovative ways to finance the stimulus. Whereas instead, what we've tended to do is to say, well, we won't have a real stimulus at all except for a monetary stimulus, which, you know, what we've seen in the last decade can be quite problematic over the long run. So uh, what I'm trying to say is I, I think continuously talking about should governments borrow more when actually they can't borrow more at, an, at a reasonable rate may not help us as much as saying, are there other ways to mobilize funding? Like I said, either a solidarity tax, using the social security funds, trying to redirect domestic savings um, and being much more careful about how we use the money that's in the budget might be more helpful. Um, thank you, thank you, Neva. Um, and, and hopefully we'll um, um, get to 
have an idea of what was presented uh, in the in, in the summit in, in in France in terms of uh, uh, the help uh, financial wise um, for for the countries in Africa to recover. Um, um, Dr. Chikomera, do you probably want to respond to um, uh, your, your, the, the question that was raised earlier? On. I was I was about to say to your countrymen. Um, and, and hopefully you will uh, finalize uh, the discussions back home if uh, we don't have enough time. Um, uh, colleagues from um, UNECA, Dr. Maponga and Zwanel, I'm not sure if you would want to make any comments on the basis of um, your experiences in the work that you, you're currently doing um, um, so that we can also have that aspect as well. Um, you can decide on your own who takes the bite. Um, my brother Gibson. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh... And thank you very much, uh, Chafur, for the, 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 the point uh, 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 raised. I, I think he's right in terms of uh, the, the, the paper didn't go uh, in depth in terms of uh, categorizing and looking at the in, in informal sector. But if you look at the, uh, the, the slide that uh, of the findings from uh, uh, Zimstad, it's, it's actually telling to see which categories of people were affected is more the uh, wage earners and the informal sector uh, are players who, because yeah, for example, where you had the closure of markets and, the, and the travel restrictions, these people could not uh, be able to uh, trade. You look at the cross-border traders, they were also uh, affected. But I think a more uh, detailed study could actually un unravel more, more details, not just the informal sector, but it could also even look at it from a gender perspective. And you look at people with disabilities, you look at vulnerables like uh, children, there they, they are differential impacts of the different categories uh, of, of, of players. But I think the, the point that that slide shows, it shows that the informal sector, yes, they were uh, affected. And again, because they didn't have much in terms of uh, savings to fall back on, to be able to uh, uh, provide a buffer for the period where they were economically inactive. Then when you look at how government is, uh, should engage other partners, I think what this uh, pandemic has shown, it has also shown that there was a rallying together, not just of government, but with the different partners coming in and uh, providing assistance. You look at the private sector. When you look at some of the programs that are there, for example, a number of uh, NGOs are looking at uh, issues of resilience and how we can bolster resilience in urban areas and rural areas, the number of programs in that area, the number of programs within the WASH program, uh, water sanitation and hygiene, which is critical for COVID-19. And I think we have seen a, a number of uh, partners uh, repurposing their funding to address those, those areas, even within the area of uh, social infrastructure. So I think there's quite a bit that uh, that has been done. And I think uh, even an, an analysis of uh, this way could also be, be informative. But I think broadly, what we have seen is uh, government and various partners coming together to address some of the challenges that uh, the COVID pandemic has brought to the fore. I think that's what I would uh, say for now. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Doc. Um, um, Colleagues from UNEC, I don't, I'm, I'm not putting you on a spot, but just uh, um, and if you don't have anything to share for now, that's fine. Any other taker on, on the issues presented? Um, like I indicated, I requested about at least uh, 10 minutes or less uh, for us to um, wrap up on this important conversation um, and, and, and probably to inform um, some of the policy directions moving, moving forward. Um, um, as part of our response. Um, uh, yes, Jay, my hand is up. I'm not sure if you can see it. Oh, okay. I couldn't see, see it. Uh, thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, th uh, uh, thanks, Jay. Uh, Jay, I think the, the, the point raised by Neva and also repeated by you, I think is very important in these discussions to say to what extent are we having regional coordination cooperation to deal with the with, 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 with the issue of COVID. So by, by this, I think we are, we are, we are all looking forward to, from, from SADAC as a, as, a, as a starting point to say to what extent are we doing this? Because why I'm saying this 
we, we, we understand and appreciate that uh, these countries have got different economic uh, challenges and they cannot respond at the same scale. For example, what South Africa can do, uh, what South Africa can do uh, is Zimbabwe instead may not be able to do given their fiscal challenges. So I think that question, Chair, if you can maybe try to probe some conversation around that, I think it will actually help uh, this dialogue uh, uh, going, going forward. That's all I want to say, Chair. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, any um, any takers on on on, on that? Because <laughs> I also don't want Hello, to <laughs> don't good, want to. Oh, uh, thank you very thank you very much, Mzonen. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, from from the SA side, very briefly, our main focus has been on the issue of indebtedness. Uh, lately being, of course, we were indebted way before the COVID, but the indebtedness has uh, has risen quite sharply. So ECA work has focused on how we can we can help us uh, member states to address this problem. You may have heard about the our initiatives at the beginning of this when ECA was calling for a, a hundred, I think hundred billion, um, billion dollar assistance to African countries. That, that has been our input. And I think we are also participating in this ongoing or just ended Paris discussion on, uh, on, on Western countries to assist. So that is one area or, uh, that we are focused on as ECA. The second one is to um, do analytical work on the uh, issues of inequality. As we know that our sub-region is the most unequal and this uh, pandemic has, uh, has uh, made this even more worrisome. And so we are trying to engage member states on how they can do this, uh, particularly as it affects mostly uh, women and the youth. So that's where our analytical work is now focusing on. And we are talking to a few countries uh, on this issue. Lastly, Chair, we are putting in place some analytical studies. Some of them will be um, uh, the focus of next week's uh, forum by ECA about how do we engage the SMEs and the private sector to contribute to, towards recovery? How do we make the environment conducive for them to engage? So that's where uh, our our main our main um, involvement in trying to to respond to the COVID. And I would invite all attendees in this August meeting to, to join us next week, 27, 28, uh, on, in that forum. And we have extended already invitations. And those who have not received it, please uh, let us know. We will send an invite and a link to next week's forum. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, my brother. Um, uh, Dr. Maponga, you, you, you can go ahead. Yes, uh, th thank, thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Buzwanele. I think he's uh, about covered uh, the bulk of uh, the work that we've been doing as ECA in this uh, particular endeavor to address the challenges uh, of COVID. Uh, just to re-emphasize that um, we strongly believe that uh, given the nature of our industrial base and industrial activities in the, in the sub-region, micro, small and medium scale enterprises are really the route through which maybe we can build back better or bounce back better or accelerate recovery going, going forward. And our discussion uh, next week will touch on uh, micro, small and medium scale enterprises, especially some of the policies that are designed to nature them, especially policies around uh, special economic zones to see how really they can be part of these various uh, uh, value chains, take advantage of maybe the is never presented. The commodity prices are looking up, but how can we intensify the value chains 
along those commodities so that we 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 capture all the benefits of the linkages around commodity processing and, and sort of uh, value addition just to add on to what uh, uh, mr zingai mentioned um, activities at regional level i think we have to recognize also that a lot of activity has been taking place at SADC level i think if you go through the since the the pandemic started i think they've had uh, various discussions at ministers of health level looking at uh, things around food uh, procurement things around making it easier for you know for movement of goods across the, the borders you know putting together some form of uh, uh, protocols and and conditions and allowing the movement of uh, essential goods essential medicines across our borders and also you know the, within the broader industrial uh, industrialization framework of the subregion i think the issues around the pharmaceutical se sectors were discussed in great, greater intensity how do we then build the capacity of the pharmaceutical sectors within the industrialization a program of the subregion to, to 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 react and respond not only to the COVID pandemic but also to other health challenges within the subregion. I think that discussion gathered momentum during uh, during this particular this particular period. I thought I would add that on to what Ms. Wanele said. Thank you. Um, thanks, Dr. Mo, uh, Dr. Mopong. Um, I think we only left with about uh, two uh, two minutes. Um, um, so, um, do you probably perhaps want to make some few remarks uh, um, as we are about to close? Um, but I, from my side, I mean, this is a has been a very um, um, important discussion um, with um, important reflections, which we obviously need um, as we as as we move forward and, and try to help each other. Uh, to recover um, from 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 this um, experience that we we actually going through. Um, so over to you, um, um, Sol, and thank you very much. Thanks very much, um, Temba, and thanks um, to all the uh, panelists for your excellent presentations and for the the good discussion we've had. Um, unfortunately, we don't always have lots of time for these events, but I think it's useful to get a sense of, of what the key issues are. Um, and we will share the, the draft paper with everyone who's been on the call, as well as the PowerPoints, um, and we'll, we'll then load it onto our website as well. Um, but one of the key issues for me is that understanding how we've approached the pandemic and the economic responses is very important if we're looking at where, where our next steps are. If we um, have concerns around a second wave of economic decline, um, so the, the risk is that uh, response to the um, economic um, issues around the pandemic starts to falter because we see the vaccine coming out, we see the, the health risks uh, minimized because um, the, the vaccine starts getting rolled out, but we, we still run the risk of um, a, a, a second challenge, a second wave of economic decline because um, the liquidity measures that the global north have put in place or the responses that they've taken to stimulate demand start to run out um, and that starts then impacting on metals prices and things that have bolstered our economy to date. So looking at the economic responses and thinking about our next steps are very important. I think one of the speakers raised the importance of um, keeping support um, to the small business sector and making sure that we have a thriving small business sector um, as a, one of our policy responses is really, really important. And we, in about a month's time, we'll have another seminar looking specifically at the small business sector and seeing what needs to be done to strengthen that sector. Thanks very much, um, Temba. Thank you. Thank, thanks all. Um, colleagues, it was... Uh... Um, nice seeing some of the old faces around. Um, um, let's uh, make our own contributions and, and hopefully, Dr. Maponga, the, the point is that we would not want to have uh, these same conversations in different platforms. Um, so um, when it's all possible, um, let's share um, these ideas and see how we can be able to um, help colleagues, uh, whether in the public sector or private sector or in the research and development space. Um, 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 to coordinate our inputs in this process. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues.